Okay, so um, my name is Jennifer Murtazashvili. I'm the director of the Center for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh. And it's a great honor today to have this distinguished guest with us for our first virtual conversation, which is about the events unfolding in Belarus. And it is an enormous honor to have Yaroslav Romanchuk uh, with us. He's a former presidential candidate in Belarus. He ran for president in 2010. He's currently the executive director of the Analytical uh, Center Strategy and president of the Scientific Research Mises Center in Minsk. Um, he's a prolific scholar, thinker, writer. He's written 12 books, uh, 6,000 articles, and uh, has an encyclopedic understanding of economic and political reforms, especially uh, not just in Belarus, but across the post-Soviet space and many other contexts. So it's an enormous honor to have you with us today, Yaroslav. My pleasure and honor to be with you. I'm looking forward to our conversation because these are the issues that are very important, not only to Belarus, but to uh, the whole world, as uh, we are dealing not only with uh, some emotional outbursts, but with very deep uh, processes that it's important to understand. So I've listened to a number of your conversations and I've read uh, some of your work. And you once famously said that revolutions across the post-Soviet space fail because they are not revolutions of ideas. Are we seeing a revolution of ideas? In uh, in Belarus, uh, that's definitely the revolution, but the ideas are not uh, the ones that would ensure sustainability, inclusiveness, and long-term development of a civilized uh, Western country. Uh, the idea that opposition has is very simple. Uh, that was to hold free and fair democratic elections. Uh, formerly, we had uh, presidential elections on the 9th of August, but uh, we, as Belarus is one of the last dictatorships in uh, Europe, uh, the nature of elections was that we can hardly call, uh, use this term to describe political and administrative processes. Uh, Belarus uh, lacks uh, democratic procedures. We don't have any division of, lay, of powers. We don't have independence of judiciary. Belarus ranks one of the worst in terms of uh, freedom of press, uh, liberty. Uh, and when we, when, uh, we have election, we always have it, uh, as I call it, political performance presidential election, because uh, the way it is run def definitely does not allow it to have in a fair, transparent way. The authorities always uh, stage it in the way that uh, they know how to target the uh, number they want, and they discriminate against anybody who is strong enough to challenge the uh, current first president of the country. So. Um, the idea was to get rid of the president who has been running Belarus for 26 years. Uh, that, that is his sixth term in office and everybody's sick and tired of him. Uh, you know that he has been running the country with um, different um, waves in a way, right? First, he ran to kill corruption. Uh, he didn't do that, so his, this fight with corruption became chronic. Then he said, well, we should reunite with Russia. Uh, that ensured access to Russian free or energy resources and then uh, to Russian markets that, that boosted the economy and many people were happy about that. But then Russia turned into the country that says, okay, we gave you uh, material resources, we gave you access to market. Why don't you give us political power? Why don't you share your sovereignty with us? And so that's also a line of development uh, was not quite uh, accepted by the authorities. And that's uh, a recent then, change. That is a recent well, change. That is a more yeah, recent that's, change. Uh, uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll go back to that because that's very, Russia is a very big, big uh, chunk of uh, information. And uh, um, so Lukashenko was the guy who ensured two quite uh, valuable periods in Belarusian economy and history. Uh, he doubled GDP uh, in dollar terms uh, from 1994 to 2005. Everybody believed, okay, this is it. Uh, he pledged to restore 
a Soviet style governance system. He did that. Uh, he essentially manages the, managed the country as a uh, joint stock company with uh, major, being a major stockholder, judge, licensee, you name it. And then there came another period, uh, which is phenomenal because he doubled GDP in dollar terms from 2005 to 2008, uh, from 60 to, uh, to, from 30 to $60 billion. Right. And uh, very many people who study transition said that, well, that's a, a unique country because without any uh, free market uh, reforms, without private property, without free trade, uh, Belarus managed to show the result, which is equal to uh, Central Eastern Europe champions who performed more better and uh, best in terms of transition indicators by European Bank for Reconstruction Development. So, but underneath that success was obvious, oil, oil products and gas, very cheap, very uh, good for uh, uh, turning into uh, hard cash by selling it at the world prices to uh, euro. And that was done uh, for about 15 years and the, what we call it energy grant from Russia to Belarus uh, reached at some years to 15% of Belarusian GDP. So that was very, very favorable to uh, support Belarusian political regime. And nobody, people in fact didn't care much because in uh, 2000, the average salary in Belarus was just $100, 2000, right? That was much lower when Lukashenko took power. By uh, 2014, that was about $600. Mm -hmm. And people believe, well, that his model works, though he does like democracy, but probably we are working on it. We are young democracy, we are democracy in the making. So we will go back to it once we reach some level of prosperity. Later. But then, later. That's right. Later, later, later. But then a uh, great recession came uh, and uh, Belarus entered into the stage of kind of, you know, judgment time, judgment uh, uh, dozen of years when uh, GDP growth was minimal. And in the last 10 years, it, uh, it is less than 1% uh, a year. That makes that we are in uh, stagnation and uh, the system ran out of power. So as uh, Ludwig von Mises described in his wonderful book, Socialism, written in 1922, uh, socialism collapses not because of some external uh, dominance or intervention, that collapses because of the governance mistakes, both in uh, the government and in the commercial corporate sector. That is happening in Belarus. So we entered 2020 before coronavirus hit uh, our country within recession. So we just weigh in like minus 2% of GDP. Then coronavirus happened. Lukashenko was the maverick that did not want to right. follow the traditional way of dealing with that. So the economy wasn't shut down. People were in the streets and Lukashenko denied coronavirus in his like first two, three months saying that if you don't see it, it does not exist. So that's weird stuff, but uh, people uh, grudgingly accepted that, but at the same time, when we didn't have enough information about the people who are ill, didn't have enough protection for doctors, didn't have numbers of those who uh, passed away because of coronavirus, and that was the atmosphere when uh, Belarus entered the political uh, campaign. Uh, so Lukashenko had problems with uh, his uh, core electorate, which is uh, budgetary workers, doctors, teachers, workers of state enterprises who supported him because uh, people did not see any connect, uh, like felt disconnected with uh, the government. Uh, there was an in interesting um, case when Lukashenko ordered all uh, kids to high school uh, on the 1st of May, but that was like done, okay, parents, you decide whether you send your kids uh, to school or not. And 70% of parents refused to do that refused to follow the order of Lukashenko. And we, we uh, interpret that as like silent uh, disobedience campaign. And that was- Due, due to the coronavirus. Yeah, because of That's coronavirus. Right. And then a uh, political campaign started and we had three new faces, uh, one blogger, one uh, ex-IT uh, 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 park chairman and a uh, Russian banker who, Belarusian banker who chaired Russian bank. And um, 
that was uh, intense from the very beginning. Like two or three month, uh, uh, weeks into the campaign, uh, the first one was arrested, the blogger, under provocation. Then the second one was arrested, the banker. Uh, criminal, criminal charges of money laundering, of uh, tax evasion, and like provocation in the first case. So all these uh, street leaders were arrested very, very uh, smoothly. And uh, so it happened that we had uh, a heroic deed of uh, the wife of one of the uh, persons who was detained, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, uh, who is a housewife. She never ran any political campaign, she was a how, because she said, I know how to make meatballs. I have no, no idea how to do anything else. And it was very uh, impressive the way she transformed herself within the next uh, two months, starting like July and August, when she decided to run to save basically her husband from prison. And then uh, she got registration. Nobody else from Democratic candidates was registered. And as a result, uh, the headquarters of uh, the banker and IT guy merged with uh, the headquarters of uh, Tikhanovskaya. And uh, we had this campaign of what we call three graces, three grace ladies uh, running the campaign. And the reason it was staged like that probably was that Lukashenko at one point said that the Belarusian constitution is not for women that it's a male's job to, to run the country, and it's only a man could be president of Belarus. And uh, so the place of, uh, the, of a woman is in the kitchen, you make uh, soups, you eat the horse, and stuff like that, right. And that was like outrageous, and uh, it hurt many uh, women. And as a result, these three graces, they ran a wonderful campaign going from city to city, and we had the biggest crowds, uh, reaching 65,000 people in Minsk, up to 15,000 in Goma, other, other cities of Belarus, even small cities, when you've got like 10% of the population of a small town, that's a big, big event. So everybody was enthusiastic, and, and as I said, the idea was very simple. We want a new face, we want a new president, we want change. The change was like definitely dem democracy, uh, freedom, and the independence of the country. Lukashenko ran the campaign, uh, with a lot of uh, hysteria and, uh, and kind of a day. I want to defend my country from invasion. We are on the verge of war. And uh, he did not specify uh, who is our enemy, but uh, different uh, suggestions said that it is the Kremlin and the Russia. Uh, they wanted just to uh, get rid of uh, our sovereignty and offered Lukashenko a deal that would essentially mean the merger. So he said he vehemently refused that, saying, no, I would never accept that. It's, yeah, we would fight to the last blood and soldier to defend our motherland. But that was like a very uh, militant, uh, aggressive rhetoric. And, uh, but we had different opinion polls and uh, polling in the internet, which is not like scientifically pure. At the same time, uh, Lukashenko had different even uh, opinion polls in the internet, in social groups. He got like three, five percent. So, and uh, the graffiti around the country was like three percent. Everybody knew what it, what it meant, just three percent. Sasha, which is Alexander Lukashenko, three percent, meaning that that's the uh, way that the level of popularity Lukashenko has. Of course, that was like metaphor, because in fact, uh, opinion polls showed that his popularity is about 15, 20%, and he could hardly, uh, in the best case scenario for him, he could hardly rely on the victory in the first round. And, but of course, he could not accept the idea of losing to a housewife. So uh, our, political campaign is built or like voting is uh, arranged in the following way. Uh, let's say when the uh, day of election is Sunday, the voting starts on Tuesday. So essentially five days of, two, five days of voting uh, when uh, there are no observers, uh, ballot boxes are without any control. And the, this year, uh, nobody, uh, very, very few observers were registered in fact to observe. We had these wonderful pictures when uh, observers were not allowed to be uh, present at the ballot station. So they used binoculars. Just imagine the guy with a binocular standing uh, 
uh, like 10 minutes to the window of the school where the ballot station is. And he's trying to observe what's going on inside. It was like uh, caricature. But uh, uh, IT guys held this, uh, this uh, internet platform called Voice of Vote, where they asked everybody who voted for Tikhanovskaya to uh, copy, to, uh, to photograph a ballot paper and send it to that particular uh, website. And in addition, they had uh, like an exit poll, which is not allowed, but they just asked people who they voted for. And uh, so we had a lot of evidence uh, saying that Tikhanovsky essentially won with a landslide uh, rather than Lukashenko. Another thing is that we had uh, quite a few ballot station commissions that refused to falsify results and show real numbers. The real numbers were like, just imagine two neighboring polling stations. In the one polling station, which is fair and, uh, and honest, we have 75% for Tsikhanovska. On the other hand, it's the same number in support of Lukashenko. So now we have a lot of evidence and even uh, re voice recording of how uh, these commissions falsified results. So this unprecedented number of evidence that the elections uh, were rigged. And uh, so, 9th of August, uh, when people showed up uh, and they waited for the first official results, and the official results came with 80% of support for Lukashenko. 80. Right. That was shock. A shock, right? Because it's okay. If that was, that had been like 52%, 53%, that would have been okay. Well, probably. I think people would have accepted that. I yeah, would probably would get would be kind of you know try to challenge that, but that would have been much closer to truth, like 40, 50 percent of something uh, unknown. But when it uh, when uh, 80 percent was declared for somebody who was accept was perceived as a three percent, that was outraged, and very many people who were close to the authorities said, "Well, it's too much. You know, it's such a big lie. Nobody would believe that." Mm -hmm. And in the very first day. When protests emerged in the streets of Minsk, uh, the first wave of aggression happened. So uh, uh, protesters and even people who just uh, were wearing white bands uh, on, this, on the wrists uh, or white clothes, they were beaten severely by special police, by troops in uniforms, uh, tear gas was used, rubber bullets were used, and uh, like these sound grenades. Uh, so you just right. throw the grenade and just explodes. And in Belarusian case, they were not covered by plastic, but metal. So essentially that was lethal weapon. And uh, on the 9th of August, the first uh, demonstrator was murdered, a 34 year old uh, man. And uh, that was first, again, the authorities tried to say that he was trying to uh, throw a Molotov cocktail, but uh, obviously all associated, associated press, uh, very many people saw that it, he was like raising his hand without any weapons, so that obvious blood, cold blood in murder. Another guy, 25 year old uh, in Gomel was arrested and he was like walking, he wasn't even part of the demonstration. He was walking along the street and he was just uh, taken uh, by the police and he uh, had heart problems and uh, he couldn't breathe, but nobody cared about that. So essentially uh, he died there and uh, again, uh, that was the second casualty. Uh, and uh, the level and cruelty and brutality of tortures was unprecedented. All in all, about 7,000 Belarusians were detained. And it was like, we had even recording when there's kind of a uh, detention center in Minsk and uh, you see the recording when moans and cries of the people horrible. who were tortured. It was such a horrible scene, but that happened on the 9th and 10th of uh, August and 11th, three days, right? And I think that the authorities believe that, well, three days, okay, we just, you know, stifled all the um, protests. People are scared that they won't be able to um, go on with the protests. And for three days, internet was shut down in Belarus. So we, I couldn't use any messengers and the internet that was like, you know, uh, a firewall 
allegedly uh, uh, built by Chinese and uh, monitored by Chinese. But some people were saying, saying that Telegram was still working. Yeah, no, 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 it's like no. some places Telegram right. worked probably, but most of the time, you know, it, you, that, that was really no connection. I couldn't get anywhere, nobody could get in touch with me, so that was it. And once this uh, firewall was off, then we decided to communicate and see what, what would happen during these days. And, and everybody was shocked because when we saw the level of cruelty and brutality and torture, where we are kind of, you know, people were outraged. And the response of that was that women in white clothes, with white flowers, uh, stood along the streets of uh, Russian cities and waved and, uh, and, and pleaded uh, uh, police and the government to stop brutality to free people and to essentially investigate what happened what happened in the country because just this kind of uh, violence was absolutely unacceptable and instead of uh, having no protest these uh, again we have this uh, again the first female revolution in the world right because women were the most the biggest driving force on the fourth and fifth day of the re of the protest so they lined along the streets and there were thousands thousands and dozens of thousands of them, flowers, very joyous, very friendly, uh, very orderly, you know, that uh, even Russians who observe uh, what happened in Bali, they say that uh, it's, just imagine, you have the crowd of 200,000 people, like in su last Sunday, and they, the crowd, and people in the crowd crossed the street and they're uh, waiting for the green light, so waiting for the green light, and, and like, the square before the rally and after the rally. All clean, no rubbish, no paper. So people, Belarusians, cleaned everything after they took part in the demonstration. So that it was, say nothing about like, broken benches, broken cars, burns, nothing of that happened. And so that's why it's like the most peaceful uh, demonstration of political will and uh, the will of the people and the will of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and uh, for the first time uniquely in Belarusian history, workers finally realized that they are not just workers, but citizens. And uh, at one point, there is a small town, Zhodina, where they make huge lorries, like for queries. And uh, the, the third shift, which uh, ended like in 1 a.m., people, workers were walking home from, from the enterprise, from, from work. And uh, the special police, they thought that that's a demonstration. So they tried to, uh, they beat them. And workers were so outraged, just imagine you are, you are, you're tired after working in, the, in, in your plant and instead of just going home, you are beaten and taken to, to police. And they outraged them saying, what's going on? So they demanded the mayor of the city to come and uh, report. And, uh, and that is a big enterprise, one of the champions of the Russian central plan economy. And uh, all the countries saw that like almost live because of the Telegram channels, which really was instrumental. We have one Telegram channel called Nechta Live. Uh, the audience uh, grew from like under 200,000 to about 2 million, two million. Uh, mm -hmm. for two weeks. That was a world record. Not a single media <laughs> anywhere in the world uh, grew like that in, I mean, popularity and, and audience. It's so got to be one of the largest Telegram channels in the world, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. So uh, right now we see this kind of, you know, people learned the truth. People were outraged by brutality. And we just, people said, you know, Nazis in the Second World War did not treat Belarusians that badly as uh, Belarusian police. So it said, stop brutality, investigate, free everybody, and free and fair election. Workers, political opposition, civil society, everybody. So I think that Lukashenko zeroed his support and uh, he was at a loss because he didn't know all these crowds, especially when he staged uh, the meeting. Just officially, he got 80% of the vote, right. but he had to drive his voters uh, to Minsk from all over the country to get like 20 or 30,000. And that was it. At the same time, when his meeting was over, we had uh, like 500,000 in Minsk and that was like everybody was so full of, uh, of joy and that's for the first time from the sense of belonging to the Belarusian nation. Because people like, okay, we speak Russian, we are like in between. And that was, that's why very many observers argue that this is the birth of the Belarusian nation when, when we are seeing that.
And for three, four days, no um, violence, uh, kind of, you know, joy, and uh, this feeling that we have won. But Lukashenko, you know, is a very cunning and very sophisticated politician. Uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya was tortured and uh, essentially psychologically, and she now, she uh, fled to Lithuania. Uh, she definitely doesn't have much experience to behave in a proper way. She's got, I don't know what kind of advisors and uh, those kind of reports that we don't have an obvious political leader, which was very good in a, in a decentralized uh, cloud social networks initiatives, got together in different parts of the city. And the whole city was kind of, you know, in the part of the demonstration. But uh, then when uh, people demonstrated their will for change, uh, we needed uh, some political uh, leadership which was not in place. And uh, so they tried to form a kind of a consultative council, which uh, today General Prosecutor's Office declared as an attempt to stage coup d'etat, so the, the open criminal investigation. And uh, uh, yesterday, and again, uh, beating had renewed, and uh, about uh, 5,000 people were uh, released from prison. Uh, still, they argue that about 2,000 are still there, and the reason are they are still not still there because of the severe beatings and uh, the state of their health. So uh, about 30 persons are still missing. And uh, when uh, my colleagues, some, some of my friends told me the stories, the evidence of what happened to them, that's just to you know, that's really uh, that vi in violation of UN uh, uh, like documents on banning uh, tortures, even in wartime. Right. To say nothing right. about peaceful time. And so uh, and Lukashenko managed to regroup himself. Uh, uh, expectedly, well, what we can, can be uh, expected, he got support from the Kremlin. And that's kind of something that is, uh, can have long-term consequences because he ran his campaign against the Putin and Russia establishment for independence and uh, in the situation when everybody was against him, he again he appealed to Russia for assistance. And uh, so we don't know, suddenly with uh, his voice changed, he was like at a loss, he was nervous, he didn't know how to behave himself. Uh, he was like mumbling something. And finally, in the uh, last two days, he kind of restored his confidence. And uh, again, uh, uh, detentions uh, resumed, beatings resumed, and we don't know what to expect in the coming weekend. So there can be, another like harsh times and uh, to add insult to injury is something that uh, means that Lukashenko is, uh, cannot uh, uh, be a legitimate president for most of Belarusians is that he awarded uh, all those policemen and special troops that beat the people in the streets and detention centers. That was like, you know, uh, like uh, awarding a torturer for what he, he, he did instead of like uh, having a thorough investigation. And that's the atmosphere we are in right now. So uh, uh, we had uh, some of the uh, people in Lomikatura began to uh, flee the ranks. Some of the military people began to uh, get rid of uh, or to leave their, their service. Uh, we had uh, like uh, chairman of the National Theater uh, left his uh, position and he was fired by the way. He said it was against it, he was fired. Then now uh, we had uh, some top official in the uh, government, uh, but uh, uh, most of the generals, most of the special int intelligence services bosses, they're still with Bukashenko. So uh, in many cases that reminds me of uh, the situation like in Venezuela, where like two centers of power here, uh, you know, you see, uh, European Union did not recognize the elections. Uh, so uh, I don't know what the, the Russia did. And that is something that many people believe would uh, uh, the scenario of Russia. So when Russia, like in 2010, uh, arranged or staged something, which was so horrible that the West said, no, no, we won't accept you. In the end of the day, uh, Russia said, okay, now we assisted you and now you must uh, follow our model of behavior and uh, uh, our menu is just, you must merge with us. So the, the path forward now seems very uncertain. Uh, last weekend, uh, so there, were, uh, 
there were, there were so many protests that it seemed like Lukashenko's government was really on the verge of collapse. It doesn't seem exactly. so certain, right? It it, seems well, that's what I said. Uh, if we had had a leader at that time, right. with this kind of support, uh, that would have been like, I remember 2004 in Georgia, Rose Revolution, when Saakashvili in the parliament, right. on the stage of that, and they forced the government to resign to hold free and fair election. Like, but in Belarus, we had the crowd, we had the enthusiasm, but there was nobody to, to, to lead that crowd. And that was like, okay, so now the question we ask ourselves is for how many days and how long should we protest and be on the streets in order to force Lukashenko into accepting defeat. But with uh, Russia support, he's not likely to do that. He'd rather uh, do something else, which is to resume using brutal force against people and use what they like, get hybrid methods of uh, enforcing people into his line of behavior. Do you see the prospect of an alternative leader emerging right now? Oh, we shouldn't have an alternative leader because we have a leader, an elected president, pro, like mm -hmm. the uh, the lady Svetlana Tikhanovskaya won the election. Right. And uh, we had like statistical uh, data to prove that, a lot of uh, evidence. But what we, uh, and she ran with just one thing again, hold, I said, I'm not a politician. I'm here yeah. just to win, to ensure that for the first time in 26 years, Belarus finally has free and fair election. Right. And right now, so once, uh, Lukashenko accepts that, then there will be election process. I think that OEC standards would be uh, the best for to run to have this kind of campaign, and that would initiate constitutional reform again. But uh, right now, if you look for an alternative leader, then that would, would like a neutralize uh, or like uh, zero the potential and the legitimacy of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. That's and why she promised elections in six months, right? She said that if she yeah, won, she said that she yeah, exactly. Win. Right. So, so that that's why, started. right? So she said that uh, this council that was set up, and that's also like a lot of people and uh, not quite a uh, certain gender, would uh, be the one to negotiate uh, on a mm -hmm. transition. Mm -hmm. But that the agenda of the council mm -hmm. is very vague. That's why uh, General Prosecutor's Office and uh, Lukashenko said they want to uh, have constitutional coup d'etat. That's why we would uh, prosecute them uh, on the, uh, based on their law. And uh, nobody knows whether they, all these people or members of the council would be arrested or not. How would the authorities treat this council, uh, especially if Russia gets involved, whether Russia would send special troops or advisors or uh, like, you know, even by Russian television people uh, were on strike and, uh, uh, and uh, Lukashenko allowed about 40 Russian journalists to step in and do their work. So, I mean, uh, this must have surprised you. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. So, but I think that nobody first, uh, I talked to many people and monitor the situation. I would never uh, believe that Lukashenko uh, and his team uh, ordered 80% of support uh, at this particular situation. It was like an open blow, uh, sign of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, absolute uh, ignoring uh, people's will. 80% was out of the question. Even many Russians say, if that he got like 55 percent right. that would be it would have been secondly acceptable. that was one catalyst so uh, again so the situation when people felt the grudge against him coronavirus way of treating people were uh, kind of you know deceived people did not feel support uh lukashenko said i would not help anybody and people wonder you know lukashenko had this big leviathan uh, 50 percent of gdp government expenditures and in the time of crisis he's refusing to give any support to anybody mm -hmm. like minimal support to even to doctors to nurses to people who were like in touch with the first line front of dealing with coronavirus so say well, why do we need this uh, if uh, the government is to provide uh, assistance to people in emergency, this is the emergency, and the government is nowhere there. So that was it. So that is event plus 80%, and plus then all these, you know, atrocities and torture, tortures that uh, were shown on uh, Telegram channels, on social networks, they have every evidence of the people, and they, it was like spread like fire, because, you know, it's... Belarus said, "Why we do we we pay police and police uh, uh, use 
brutality and force against us, killing our people and uh, and uh, turning them into cripples. So it, it's unacceptable. And this kind of, you know, it's again, it's not about West versus Russia, NATO versus uh, any other military union. It's not about liberalism versus socialism. That's about basic uh, human behavior, basic human uh, needs. And when, when you and Lukashenko, you know, when they broke these particular uh, rules, right, I think that people, all the people are revolted. Even if they are um, workers of collective farms or state, for, state enterprises, uh, if you go to the to a countryside right now, you know, 1994, even like 10 years ago, everybody was for Lukashenko or predominantly. Right now, when you started, you start protecting Lukashenko, saying, oh, to Lukashenko, you'll be probably beaten. So it's like, oh gosh, he must, he must go. We are sick and tired of it. So the change of the mood. I've read that about 80% of the economy is controlled by the state, by the state-owned yeah. enterprises, somewhere near there. So it seems that the fact that, that so many who are involved in the state sector have turned against the president is yeah. really the most exactly. significant explanation as to... Uh, of course, there's not a single explanation, but it, it has played an important role in, in the changes that we're seeing. And I want you to jump ahead for, for a second, because yeah. you're such an expert on reforms. You've worked on reforms, I mean, not just in Belarus, but in, in, you understand how these reform processes work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've gone beyond just the ballot box, right, in studying democracy, but understanding how bureaucracies, how economic mm -hmm. reforms work. Yeah. So imagine that there is a change. We don't know what that change will look like. What would be your recommendations for how to reform the Belarusian economy going forward? <laughs> we have another eight, eight hours to talk. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Especially uh, given uh, the role of state-owned enterprises in, in right. the um, uh, revolution or whatever so we're calling it. Fundamentally, we are looking forward to this uh, window of opportunity that many countries have. Uh, like Ukraine had many windows of opportunity, Tunis, all these Arab Spring countries, Georgia, uh, even Uzbekistan had it at some time. Uh, Belarus uh, has never had it still. That's why we are definitely much better prepared than any other country, knowing what should be done when we have it. And of course, uh, first you should have uh, the legitimate power, somebody, a uh, president, a head of state or prime minister, whatever uh, political system you have uh, to lead you to reforms, right? So if uh, such a person emerges, then he should form a team of people with a very clear cut agenda. And again, in order to form, we shouldn't be like, uh, very vague about, okay, we'll do institutions of market and democracy and governance. It should be very specific in terms of money policy, monetary policy, uh, taxation, budgetary policy, uh, governance of uh, assets, uh, social security reforms, labor market reforms, and trade. The basic things, of course, and uh, uh, extremely important are uh, institutions to ensure the rule of law, like courts, police, prosecutor's office, uh, attorney services, something that, again, you can hardly expect to deliver after 26 years of being under totalitarian rule. So I think that we must consider import of institutions of, uh, to ensure rule of law. So something like, especially in uh, the case of economic laws, uh, economic uh, decisions, economic courts, like in Hong Kong, like in Kazakhstan even, uh, they imported this economic force. Uh, Belarus should also have it. Without it, like Ukraine shows and uh, African countries show and Asian, uh, you can hardly rely on local judges, local police, prosecutor's office to deliver on free and fair, independent judiciary and, uh, and uh, rule of law system. So that's very, very, very important. Uh, secondly, when you talk about money, uh, Again, very important because in Belarus, like in many post-Soviet countries, the uh, people's money uh, of choice is dollar, U.S. dollars. So 70% uh, of uh, deposits, dollars, every time you talk about uh, prices of something, I want to buy an apartment, I want to buy a car, and you, you are given a price in U.S. dollars, everyone understands it. Because the reason is that Belarus... Uh, and that's another way to uh, confiscate money from the people is to uh, impose in inflation tax. 
in Belarus is ranked probably in the top 15 countries in the world, uh, the worst inflation countries in 1994 to 2019. So essentially that's why people uh, don't trust ruble because ruble does not uh, preserve purchasing power. So people's money is dollar. So I would uh, go for a multi-currency system plus legalizing different uh, e-money plus of course my favorite genuine money gold standard for any private company who can do that so that will be a historic event in the world scale and whoever wants to do that in belarus he, he would be welcome then uh two more things which are very important first is budgetary policy and taxation we have again uh major mistake, one of the most lethal mistakes of all post-Soviet countries and probably most of the developing world was to accept uh, the taxation that uh, was established in Western Europe or America uh, for, uh, for getting money uh, from the economy in uh, developing and transition countries. We didn't have governance system, we didn't have legal system, we, don't, we didn't have enough people to man and to ensure this system to work in a proper way. That's why we must come with a very simple, very, uh, very uh, innovative uh, taxation system. I designed a three tax system to collect enough money to ensure proper govern, uh, running of, of a government. Even in Ukraine, it would be no more than 28% of GDP, though it uh, pays, like spends about 5% for war with uh, military expenditure. So uh, retail sales tax, personal income tax, which is 10%, and uh, excise taxes on, uh, on the goods uh, that we all know, like uh, energy goods, uh, tobacco, uh, cigarettes. And I would definitely legalize marijuana uh, because that's a wonderful and very valuable raw material for many, many industries. Pharmaceutical industry, light industry, uh, food industry, you name it. It's, it's growing exponentially and I try to legalize that through advocating campaign with business community. But again, we had this uh, blocks in the mental activities of many people in our country saying, well, how could you do that? We are just for, uh, for, for supporting uh, drug use. And I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about this. I would definitely, I would say, I would formulate it the following way. I would expand the raw uh, material base for export facility in Belarus. So that's kind of, you know, okay. different way to, to say that. And uh, then you should uh, talk about privatization, uh, which is very important. Uh, SMEs must be the core of privatization. In uh, 2003, I drafted privatization law that took into account all major mistakes of Russian and Ukrainian privatization. And of course, uh, again, uh, you shouldn't do that in uh, the way Ukraine or Russia did, or Kazakhstan, or uh, many other countries. But again, get, giving people assets that are of no use or not used at all by the government would be very reasonable. I say, instead of nomenclature economy, you have people's economy. Right. Social security, wonderful thing where many people ignored uh, that carried out with market reforms. Again, you need a uh, uh, personal or uh, targeted money assistance to people in need. So you, we worked out a criteria of who, what a person in need is, right? So who can be qualified sure. to get assistance. And so he, he gets uh, an account and so he gets money every month. So we consider health uh, uh, issues, we consider employment issues, we consider income issues and his material status and the number of uh, people of, like children in the family. So these are all factors that are considered. And again, I calculated that if you give money to people like that in Belarus, you would uh, spend five times less money than the money you spend on corporate welfare. Right. So again, that's uh, very economical and uh, it's very efficient. So again, you, you know, and you, now, if you use blockchain technology, right. you can have it under control. There is no fraud and uh, things like that. Right. So uh, that's so we know how to, to do stuff, but we need a political will. We're will, we're waiting for red. Of course, we uh, when uh, the opposition is accused of uh, having no pro no program, 
we always say, well, we have a lot of good programs, and these are not like uh, copy paste of uh, Western Europe American no. program. IMF World Bank uh, cannot deliver on uh, dealing with uh, transition in the best way. We have experience of many countries that Absolutely. use this blueprint and uh, were like, you know, uh, missed the opportunity. So kind of, you know, our uh, intellectual potential capital uh, should be, should definitely uh, get along with a lot of cash in the world economy right now. And what makes even things even uh, better is that we are entering the fourth industrial revolution area, right. era, when uh, we have new technologies, instead of trying to uh, repair old ones, we definitely can uh, uh, apply new ones for new money, building new global uh, value chains, which definitely will be a great uh, leap forward for Belarus. And Belarus has a strong technology sector, right? yeah, so exactly. a very oh, growing do. technology sector. So be well positioned to do this. And you know, one of the issues with the privatization, uh, the privatization issues become so challenging throughout the former Soviet republics because this is the this is the point where you really see oligarchs emerge, right? This yes, is the point. Exactly during the, this period of privatization that is really important, especially in a country like Belarus that has 80%, you know, so much of, of the country still is, is in control, under state control, that this is really where you see uh, bad things emerge that- Jennifer, that rise, in this case, yes, right. in this case I would definitely um, uh, invite somebody of authority and honesty from a Scandinavian country or uh, Great Britain or New Zealand or whatever, because in this case, we would need somebody beyond any even suspicion uh, to chair the position of somebody in charge of privatization, one thing. Then uh, just you, uh, first of all, you apply one rule to uh, privatizing uh, little assets, like you have a district, a small town, and you have like uh, a market to sell, right? So the best way to support, to make it inclusive is not to sell it to whoever, right? And, but to even with the, uh, you probably won't get enough cash in the budget, but the way to support local community and uh, make it decentralized as possible, you sell it to those people who live there, who do business there, and uh, like you make inclusion by selling 25% of, uh, or giving 25% of assets or, uh, or stock to local entrepreneurs, you know, something like that or to like if you privatize big enterprises of course right. you have uh, to ensure that uh, the stock uh, work in a proper way you definitely should apply international governance standards corporate governance standards uh, rules against bribery and stuff like that and uh, so we may lose some enterprises but in the long run with all the potential definitely that will be a huge huge uh, burst forward. But Lukashenko says, well, we're not ready. He is uh, making a mistake by offering let's independent directors to run state enterprises and right. they will never be able to deliver because this is the way to uh, channel assets and profit into uh, the pockets of the few and, uh, uh, and nationalizing losses. This is what, been, what happened in Belarus for the last 25 years. Right. So, I mean, Belarus is in such a good position to learn from the mistakes of so many other countries. Uh, it's such an interesting time right now. And, you know, I just want to end this interview uh, with a very personal question. Yeah. Right. You ran for president before. You were a candidate in 2010. And I imagine, that, you know, that was at a very difficult time. Um, or it was the beginning of a difficult time, right, for, for Belarus. And I imagine for you, and it, it must be... Um, I, I can't imagine what you're feeling watching this right now. It's, a, um, uh, it's like in, um, it was a deja vu in many ways because in uh, 2010, I was tortured to make a statement to save lives of the people. And uh, Svetlana Tikhanovka, likewise, she faced uh, the same situation. I'm sure that he was psychologically tortured to make a statement and uh, the authorities uh, forced her out of the country. And again, when we have to choose and you get to face the death of life uh, question of your children and the husband who is in detention KGB hands, definitely uh, that's, uh, that's the atmosphere. So that's the psychological uh, torture. And I said that I would never, uh, I would definitely support, I support Svetlana Tikhanovska or whatever uh, for, for that heroic position because 
at the end of the day, she showed us how to be brave, how you can uh, become a, a national uh, hero within like two months from nowhere because you are driven by love. Not love and thirst for power, but love to your husband, to your uh, family. But then the uh, scope of beating definitely uh, appalled me because uh, in 2010, that was concentrated within just one night and everybody was so shocked. At that time, the regime was very, very strong. It was, it was supported by Russia from the very beginning. And uh, so we kind of, at that time, I never didn't have enough experience of street action. I don't, I'm not a street fighter. I'm an intellectual, I'm a scholar, so I'm, uh, I can do many other things, but the street is an unknown animal, animal to me. Right now, uh, when we, you feel this atmosphere of, of uh, unity, when you have like hundreds of thousands of people in the street, when you have national symbols, when you have people congratulating each other, supporting each other, uh, of course, uh, social network help, to messengers help. This kind of new information area we are in, and definitely we don't need any more television uh, papers. And those, these are the papers and television news media uh, outlets that uh, belong to the government. So that's more decentralized right now. More people to people. More uh, you built on uh, trusts of uh, networks, social networks, and that's why uh, we succeeded so far. Uh, we are. Um, I'm far from thinking that the uh, victory is ours and the battle is over. We just, you know, first we must uh, lead to the point when Belarus uh, finally has a new president, the second president, and then, then comes the uh, our time. As you asked the first question about revolution of ideas, right. because Lukashenko is a. Uh, 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 on the one hand, he is very consistent in what he has been doing. He never called himself a liberal. He never called himself a free market uh, supporter. So he's consistent with his Marx, Bolshevik, Lenin, Stalin type of governing, governance. Right now, I uh, am a strong supporter of quite the opposite in almost everything. <laughs> so when people are sick and tired of that uh, kind of uh, graphic, representation of the policies, like uh, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Uzbekistan, they tried to experiment with different things that uh, Belarus went through, and you can see the result. So you can see the huge failure of government as a Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And people right now, when uh, look at the uh, world value uh, seven wave uh, poll, uh, Belarus showed that many more Belarusians uh, take responsibility for their own lives. They don't expect so much from the government. And so now we have to deliver on what institutions should be in place to ensure uh, free market or people's economy, people's uh, participation and uh, kind of, you know, this uh, humanistic approach to economy uh, instead of economics, uh, mechanical, technocratic uh, approach that uh, many transitional and developing countries uh, did uh, many for many years. You're right, following formulas rather than ideas and rather than uh, people. Exactly. Um, exactly. Right. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time to be with us, for educating us about what's happening in Belarus, and for sharing your vision for the future of Belarus, and for also telling us about your very personal experiences. Um, uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, I think that uh, again, I keep telling my American friends, invite us to. Uh, educate Americans about socialism because when I hear this agenda you guys have about socialism, mm -hmm. democratic socialism, that form of socialism, oh gosh, just, you know, you, we've been through different forms and stages of socialism in this part of the world. <laughs> so we can tell you exactly what you guys will end up with if you apply even fractions of this stupid, inhuman and very inefficient socialist ideas and institutions. So we'll look forward to when this virus is over, to when the revolution has ended, <laughs> and to having you visit us here in Pittsburgh. Um, oh, thank you. Thank so you. you can lecture us on the lessons that we need to learn from all of this. That's right. So usually it's uh, where you have this uh, human action, which is <laughs> voluntary, mutually right. beneficial, versus uh, general theory of government intervention and the Leviathan as uh, an outcome of uh, good intentions. Because Lukashenko in 1994, he said, I would ensure 
good wages, develop and progress, I would deliver better results. Now, we, after another 26 years of experience and experimenting with uh, people and the assets and everything, you know, the result, it is uh, a disaster. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Thank you for okay. your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you.